Okay, so at this point we've uh, bundled our data into a JSON object. Now, as I've said, um, the JSON object itself should just have the key and value pairs. So I, so I want to avoid writing a comment in between our data. Even though it's separated with the commas, I want to avoid that. So if I'm going to write a comment about this data, don't write it over here because that's inside the object. I would write it over here after the object just to be safe. So I'll write here a JSON uh, formatted object with all our data. So we took those input items and we bundled it together. We bundled it together into one object. This is like when we were looking at um, last time. Remember, we could do something like a class dot underscore ID, and that will only console output the ID. This will uh, matter to us later. So um, we save that to to a, a little bundle and we, we output it. Okay, well what we actually do here then is we need to put this into the into the database. So next line db.put pouchdb has a put command, a put method. We're using the put method on this object. There's our database. We're going to put something into it. And we would, you know, put um, something and then comma get some result. The documentation has it in a way like this. You know, you put something, colon, something, comma, whatever. Well, that's what we've done with a class. We've bundled it already together as a JSON object. So what we're going to be putting is a class. That is our bundle of data. Comma. These, these are optionals, but often we want to put here some callback functions. We want to... Um, we get a result of either po positively saving the data to the database or some error happened that I want to deal with. So we'll create a function here, an anonymous function, and uh, we we have here the the default result. We get a couple of objects as a result. It's built into PouchDB. It all, it usually often gives us back either success or failure. So we have either error or result. These, of course, we can name them whatever we want. We can call it kitty, we can call it cat. But we've got uh, some, we could possibly have a, an error object returned to us, or we could possibly have a positive result object returned to us. Let's break apart these curly braces because we can have a, a little bit more happen. We'll create an if else statement here. So again, be careful here. This is inside of the curly braces of that anonymous <coughs> function. This is all happening at the moment that we've attempted to put the data into the database. Something happened, either an error or a result. So within the curly braces of that anonymous function now, I can say, okay, well, if it was a if it was a positive result, if if we got back result, which is an object of, you know, it happened okay, I simply want to see in the console, well, what is that object? What what am I dealing with? In the documentation, of course, it would explain to us all the possible properties of that object. I kind of want to see it for myself at the moment. So I've either got the possibility of a positive result or a negative result. That's where my else comes in. Well, okay, I'm curious about that. If there was some sort of error, just show me in the console. What is that error object? Error. We can do more complex things in a moment, but here this is the result of the classic callbacks. Remember that I said in the documentation we either have the example code in callbacks style or in promises style. 
We're using callbacks style here. I'm going to save it. I'm going to fill in some information. Maybe in the beginning for testing purposes, I'm going to fill in real information. Eventually, I'm just going to fill, fill in gibberish when I just want to get it done. For the moment, I'll put real data. Um, then I'll check my console to see what that result or error was. See if you can force errors or positive results. I'll show you how in a moment, but here's our code so far. We've got db.put. All of that is just basically still the .put method. We're putting our class bundle of data and we're getting either an error or a result. Give it a quick try on mine. That. Okay, so I, I'm going to save class 1, 2, 2, 3. This is Spanish class. Um, Instructor Smith. I'm going to save that. I still have that other console output from before. And I get an object with a property of OK, a property of ID, and a property of rev. You can further look at the data in a slightly different way there. That's telling me that I can access the ID property, the OK property, the rev property. So I won't do it just yet, but that means result.id or result. OK or result.rev. So that would show me the that specific field of data of that object. Right now I'm saying, show me the whole object. Okay, well, if I... Um, I'm going to save class 1223. This is Spanish 2, and this time Instructor Alvarez taught it. I'm going to save. Status 409. Name conflict. Message. Document update conflict. Error. True. I'm attempting, in this case, I'm forcing an error. I'm attempting to put in the same CRN uh, into the database. CRN, remember, is underscore ID, the unique one. I'm trying to put in a bit of data that's got the same ID. That may have been a mistake, or I may be trying to update it. But let's say I forgot that I had already saved class 1223. So here now, the result that happened was we got we got error object so console.log error and what this error object has a has a, a property of error which is true it has a property me message which in this case is document update conflict and name of conflict and a status number of 409 Alert. Error. Dot message. In the console, I gave myself this error message, but to the user, perhaps, I can actually output some pop-up message, and the pouch error object comes back at me with a somewhat human-readable message, and so I'm accessing it there. It's going to pop up to the user. So I'm going to refresh that. Again, I'm going to try to save in my case class 1, 2, 2, 3. I know that already exists. Just gibberish here for the moment. Save. Pop up. Document update conflict. That's a little too technical, actually, I think, for the user, but I'm just showing you here. I'm accessing one of the properties of the error object. Later on, we will do some better error checking with perhaps the status. We can look up what are all the status error codes. Make a switch statement to say in case of 409 do this, in case of 412 do that, in case of this do that. Default do something else. We'll do that later. But here I'm just showing that here's a possible way to trigger an error. I'm trying to put the same record in twice, the same document. Well, what if instead what I wanted to do 
was update an existing record. We'll get to that later. This is one error that I managed to do. Here's another error. What if I forget to put in a CRN and I am putting Android Part 3 in Instructor Campos? No CRN number. Save. ID is required for puts. In this case, it's status 412, missing ID. So I'm not putting in one of the crucial pieces of data to save into my database, an ID. And that popped up because I said alert.message, alert, error.message, and it popped up there. And again, that might be a little bit too technical for the user. What's an underscore ID? I'm just showing you that we can uh, use the pieces of this object. I get some console output that we, we got a good result. Later on, when we get this into jQuery Mobile, we have a way to do simple, nice-looking pop-ups that, you know, animate into view and then go away. We'll do that later. We don't have jQuery Mobile, so we don't, we're not really going to give the user any, any feedback just yet. What I do want to give the users some kind of feedback is if they type, if they saved a class, it's in the database. Well, notice if I positively save something. Let's say I'm going uh, to save class uh, 111, <coughs> Android 1. That class doesn't exist. It gave me an OK. I saved it to the database. I would like to clear those fields so that the user doesn't accidentally try to save the same record. And if you're curious, you go back to your application, and you go back to your index DB, and you go back to your my SDCE database by sequence. We've got data there now. You might want to look at. These zero width items, so it's zero indexed, zero in index value based. The zero width item of our database with key number one and the actual value, all of that data there. There's my C name, class name, C inst, the instructor. There is the, uh, it, it doesn't quite spell it out, but there's the, there's the underscore ID, 11223, and there's 111. And then we've got the doc ID and revision. So the ID is the 1123 in my case, or 111, and then the revision. That block of gibberish there identifies that instance of that data at this point that I saved it. Later on, when I want to update this data, actually, you know, this is, I should have written this as Spanish 1. We will be able to update this, and then eventually this will get a 2 dash something. If we update it again, it will get a 3 dash something. That's how we avoid these conflicts. And we do have then the ability to update our data, like a database. That's what I've saved so far. Let's say I save another thing. This is going to be class uh, 222, Android 2, and Campos also teaches it. Save. This is not dynamic. You do have to click this little refresh down here, and you see the third bit of data. The, the, the 2 index, or the 13, now has the, the third bit of data. And like I'm saying, I would like to clear those fields so that the person doesn't do again here, save, and now we get the pop-up while you're trying to save the same class. I want to clear those fields if they properly saved. And um, it'll clear the fields. That's, that's good user experience there. Don't try to save the same class anymore. You've already saved it, so we'll clear the fields back to the uh, code. Let's write some comments, then we'll do that. Uh, line 51 dot put adds an item adds or when we get to it or updates adds or updates an item to the database. Arguments are the data and callbacks.
simple if else to uh, deal with possibilities. So if uh, if it does get if it does get saved, new line here. I'm still in if if I did get a positive result. If it did save, I want to fn clear form function. I want to run my clear form function. This is a function that we need to create. So this will blank out the fields and let us um, let the user continue to add more data. You need to find where your where your function save class ends. In my case, line 60. You can find that by clicking on your opening curly brace of your fn save class, and following the line. In my case, it my my save class function ends on line 60. I'm going to add a comment there and fn save class. Because on the next line, I'm going to define the clear form function. Before I forget, I'll write end fn clear form. So, of course, here, make sure that you're creating this new function outside of the function we were just inside of, but make sure it's still within the uh, inside the ify the immediately invoked function that defines our whole JavaScript. So the point of what this function will do, it's, it's basic at this point, but we can make it do more, which is we want to clear these input fields. We want to reset the form. We have made a reference up at the top here, line uh, did we? No. Okay. So um, we need to reference the form class form. We need to reference it so that we can reset it. We never made any JavaScript object for it. Forgot about that. Uh, so when we had made var l button l reset l div, we forgot to make one for the whole form itself. So I'm gonna back up to the block where we made on minus about line 33. Back where we made these elements, we forgot to make one for the form itself. Um, I'll say we've got L div show as the last one. Let's make that a comma because we'll have one more. L form. What do we call this form class? Call this form class. Yeah. So L form class dollar L form class equal to pound form class. And a 
begin here. Uh, I'm creating a new variable after the previous LDIV show. Make sure you add a comma there at the end. Create a new, our new variable, and then end that line semicolon. So now we've got a reference to that object, which in our clear form function, we can reference that HTML object to reset the form, those three fields. Let me just confirm here. Uh, well, yeah, let me just confirm this. I believe we have to do this. Yeah, okay. We have to do a, a little quirky thing here. We're going to reference the, the object L form class. And uh, from what I've looked up, we then have to specify in angle bracket or square brackets the zero width form. Even though ID applies to only one object throughout our whole code, there seems to be this necessity here to say the zero width object of the array, even though there aren't any other objects in this array except for that one form. We have to say zero width object dot reset the reset jQuery method. There's a form, we're going to reset it, which form? The first form of the ID, which there's only one anyway, so that's a little quirk there, but that's how we have to do it. And the point of this now is that whenever fn clear form is invoked, it will reset that form. Now the button is already set up to do a reset, but now we've got a named function that we call when we properly save a, uh, a class into the database. Save it and run it. Save a brand new class with, with new numbers. I'm going to say class uh, 33. This is Android 3. Constructor Campos. I'm going to save that. It saves it and the fields clear out. A little bit of user interaction there, user experience. It's annoying. It would be annoying for the user to have to clear the forms themselves. We did it for them by including function clear in the result of positively saving the, uh, the data. Okay, so we can do a quick comment here. Function to clear the form fields. I want to set up a little bit more of that of that error checking. We know that there can be a problem in a person already trying to save the same class. We want to let the user know that's a problem. We also want to um, set it up so that if the user tries to save a class without a CRN, we'll tell them that problem. So right now, we're going to back up to the part of else here, where we, where we have our error. And we've got that basic alert that pops up. Instead, let's delete that alert and you can leave the you can leave the console log there because we may get we may figure out other errors than the ones we've managed to create right now. So back on line 58 or so, I want to set up a switch statement. Switch, open close parentheses, curly braces on that. Switch works by checking a possible condition. And there are various cases that could result. 
in case of a certain error, do this. In case of another error, do that. So here under switch, the condition we're looking for is error dot status. We saw that when an error appears, we get the object of status property, message property, etc. Error dot status. This is going to give us numeric error inside of the switch curly braces. Well, we have the case then of error 409. Something's going to happen there. Break. We have then case of 412. Something's going to happen there. Break. And there could be other errors that we didn't think about, so we'll have a default possibility. So a switch statement is a, is a conditional statement. It, it's based on a condition. Just like we've had the for loop, where for a certain number of times, a certain condition, we're going to do something. We have if else. That's another conditional statement. If this happens, do that, or else do this. Here's another one. Switch. So based on the current error, we've got various cases. This one, this one, and this one. We can't possibly, probably we can't think of all possible errors. I thought of 409, 412, and such. So then we have the default, in case of an error that I didn't think of, do something else. I'm going to move that console log error, if you still have it, I'm going to move that into default. Because I have here two possible errors that I know of. Well, if I don't know of another possible error, show me that error in the console. And maybe to the user alert something. And later when we get this back into our our taco project, we can do the we can do the native type of alert. We'll just say something like error contact the developer. We don't know what kind of error this is. Contact the developer. That's in the that's in the if all else fails. Error 409 is when there's a conflict in CRNs. So we'll say here to the user, CRN already exists. Backslash n, type a new one backslash n will create a new line in the pop-up. We're telling them that, that CRN already exists. Um, you, might need, you might mean a different one. So we'll get that pop-up. They'll fix it and they'll save. Later when we get this into jQuery Mobile, we'll make, we'll make a nicer pop-up. There's a little animation and such. Where do we find it in a moment? Error 412 is when when uh, they're trying to save a document without a CRN, without a valid ID. a valid CRN.
I'll make a comment up here on the switch in case of error. Pick the right response. That's what a switch statement lets us do. 409 error is uh, see CRN already exists. 412 CRN is empty. Default is unknown. Check console. You notice the syntax of this switch. It's got some condition to check in the parentheses. It's got curly braces. And then the possibilities are here. This can have a thousand lines of possibility results and then break. And none of the rest will run because we match a case. Okay, it could be this possibility. Notice again the syntax, colon there, case, something, colon, lines of code, semicolons, break, no, no need to check the rest. If I didn't have all the possibilities, the final possibility is default, with a colon, do something, break that. No more code. Save it and run it, and um, Try to put in some, first try, don't put in anything in the CRN and put something in the other fields and save it. You should get the pop-up that says, please enter a valid CRN. Then try to save a, a class, a CRN that already exists. So if you can remember a CRN you've already made, type it again. If you don't, just save a CRN, remember what it is, and then type it again to force the 409 error and get that alert. Okay, so I'm not going to save anything to my CRNs, just name, save, pop-up, please enter a valid CRN. Okay, I'll put in CRN 000, save that, good, I'm going to try to save 000 again, CRN already exists, type a new one. Find 0000, save saves. Let's pause there. Any questions on that? Are people's data being saved and the alerts and such errors? Working. I've put in some real data, some gibberish data. We're going to get to eventually, of course, to delete the data, to view the data, all of that stuff. It's a process because when we see this on a website or an app, it's so easy. Click save, it saves. Click edit, it edits. But when we need to do it from scratch, we need to deal with all those possibilities. The next possibility that's coming up is, I'd like to show this data. Right now, I can see the data in the console. Besides us in a programming class, no one knows what the console is. We shouldn't expect people to know that. Us as developers, we do. When we get this eventually to an app, there's no console here that you're going to see very easily. So of course, then that means we need to retrieve the data to show on screen. That's what's next here. I want to show the data. I have a reset, I have a save. Let's make a show button, show classes. Take all the data that's here inside of the bowels of the browser and actually show it on screen for people. Let's make a new button back on our form. Back to the code, back to line 13 or so. That's where I've got my buttons. Type reset, type button, we're gonna need a new button. type button. Let's add a new button next to the, the reset the save and we need a new button. We'll call this one uh, show classes. Um, 
value of show classes. Uh, ID BTN show. We have a brand new button there. We have the clear button, save button, show button. Okay, so if you've got a new button on screen, we have a new we have a new HTML element. Therefore, we need to make a new JavaScript element. That means over on uh, line thirty-seven, right where we created our button save, button reset, button div, button form, or element form. We need now um, the show button. The order of, the, of these things don't quite matter, but if I had remembered, I would have put them in order. So uh, here then, after form, we need L, ETN, show. And that's based on pound, ETN, show. We have that jQuery based JavaScript object based on that HTML node. Remember when we were working on the random social network, I had said it's perfectly valid to group all of your elements related to each other or conceptually with each other. This time we're doing the other version of that, where we're going to group all the elements of a certain sort of type together. So I've started to make a section of my event handlers. So below this, I will, I will add in the next event handler to handle the event of clicking the show button. Line 40, this is where we've got the this is where we've got the object on click, on the event of click. I have to save button before I have the show button. On the event of a click, we'll run fn show class, show classics, whatever we call it. It's fine as long as you remember. So now in the event of a click, show classes. We need to then define a function. We've got a function of save classes. Just to keep writing it in order after save classes, after clear form, before the end of all my code here, function show classes. is our end function show classes. show classes. What we've been doing so far over on the pouch website create update a doc. This is what we've been doing. db.put create a new document or update an existing 
If the doc already exists, you must specify its version. There is some restriction on valid property names, such as underscore ID, underscore rev. If you try to store non-JSON data, you may get inconsistent results, such as a date object. You can't save a date object directly, you have to parse it as a string. So that's a good thing to read there. But one common way to do this is, um, for example, one of the apps that I have released on the App Store is a, is a mileage, is a fuel efficiency tracking app. If you look up V Gas Mileage Tracker, it's a real app to download. And on there, the way I've got it set up is that the unique identifier, and I use PouchDB in that app, is the unique identifier is the date of the fill-up, which saves a day, a time, down to the seconds, I think, milliseconds. But date is a special kind of object which we need to parse or uh, stringify into the right format. So um, that documentation there was very useful. In our case, uh, we've been doing dot .put with callbacks, and here's what we've been doing. Again, the documentation here doesn't have the quotes. That's one of the to-dos that needs to be to done, which is we need to put quotes on all of that. Um, what we are trying to do now is fetch a doc. We're trying to get data out of the database. Retrieves a document specified by a doc ID. This is simply going to be db.get. Get what? Get a document. So, so far I've saved like five classes or something. And dot, dot get would retrieve one element at a time from from the database. I need to get um, multiple documents at once. I need a batch fetch. I need to get many things at once. All of the things from my database. DB dot all docs. Fetch multiple documents indexed and sorted by the ID. Deleted documents are only included if option dot keys is specified. So little by little you see around here that as you save data to the database and if you delete data from the database it still stores references to the data. I'm not exactly sure if it stores the whole data or just references to the data. But remember the data is just text basically. So this is saying that even if you deleted stuff we can still show what data used to exist if we specify an option. Uh, we probably won't need to deal with that if it's deleted. It's deleted. But here um, we need to retrieve lots of pieces of data. So we're going to use db.alldocs and a few documents, a few options here as well. Because doing all docs will simply retrieve a list of IDs. I want to retrieve the IDs of all my classes and the CRNs of all the classes and the instructors. And if I had made a field of notes, I want to retrieve that. I want to retrieve all the data attached to an ID. So we would have to use the option of include docs. Include the document itself in each row of the doc field. So that's going to be also each, each row of data, each field of data, not just the ID and the revision. I can specify a start and end key, so if I want to retrieve only a certain range of data, I can do that. Limit if I've got a thousand items saved in the database, I only want to retrieve a hundred. I can limit it. Skip a few things. Certain keys, etc. Okay, so it works by basically DB all docs, passing in some options in JSON format, and we're going to get a function back with either an error or a result with another if-else to deal with that. So in our code, in the show classes function, our database object is db. We're using the method dot all docs. Notice how that's spelled, capital D. We will give it a few options. 
what it retrieves is too basic for us. Options are in JSON format with a, with a key and a value. In quotes, we're saying include underscore docs. The actual value of that is true. Include also each of the fields of the document in question, comma. Let's organize that. Ascending, true. Give me the data from the database and organize it alphabetically. Ascending. Alphabetically, letters, numbers, symbols, all of that. It'll be ascending. If we don't specify that, ascending, I believe it gives us to it in the same order as the database. What did the specification say? Uh, index and sorted by the ID. So, indexed and sorted by the ID. Decent, reverse the order. So we can check what result we get by including that or not in a moment. But what we've got here is, let's retrieve data from the database, all the data from the database. We, of course, can uh, fine-tune what we retrieve later. But the result, comma, the second argument is we either got an error that the data didn't come back to us for some reason, and we need to deal with that, or we get a result, which is, yes, we got the data, let's deal with the data. So the same as before, function, this is an anonymous function, curly braces, and we get either an error or a result. The documentation says error and response. Again, these can be called anything. They can be called kitty, they can be called cat. Here we have either an error object returned or the result, the data itself. So I'm going to break those curly braces here. So that so that I can do if if else If I got a positive result, do something. If I got a negative result, console, error, positive result. Here I'm making it very obvious. Um, you might not need to make it so obvious at all points. Here, let's make it obvious. Let's see what we get at this point. We'll save it and run it. You should have data in the database. You're not going to need to add more data. This is the whole point of this. This is kind of like local storage. It remembers. So all this data that we've been saving with, with save class is, should still be there. Let's retrieve it. We're going to see, not on screen yet, of course. We're not there yet. But let's uh, retrieve it, and let's look in your console. If it did properly retrieve the data, it should show then the result object in the console. Let's see here. I'm just going to just go directly to show classes. I get an object. In my case, I've saved seven things to the database. Opening that up, okay, offset, whatever, total rows. Okay, so we have a total rows property, which would be result dot total rows, FYI. Then we've got rows, and inside of there, my zero with object to my sixth. Inside of that, that has an ID, 
I, I saved a class called 000. It's the ID or the key. My second class that I saved was 000. The third class. It, remember, this is showing me it to me already in alphabetical order. This is not the order that it was saved in originally to the database. But because I've retrieved with dot get all docs ascending true, it's putting it alphabetically ordered. So the third object here is 111. And then in the actual the actual data of 111, if I further open up doc, C inst C name. There's underscore rev, underscore ID. It's a unique identifier for this version of that data, of that class. Later on when I change this to be Android 1A, that'll change to become 2 dash whatever. So you see we've got this object all of the data is in a field of rows here if we say console.log results.rows we're simply saying it at results is at a very high level of the data a little bit deeper is rows. So check the difference there. I'm going to show classes. I get an object. And here now, it's a little bit deeper. Just these are the objects rather than all of the extra data that is that pouch is, is giving me. These are the six, these are the seven items. And I went in deeper there. And um, Like when we had the social network, we we did what did we do? We did social brackets one dot name, and that would have given me the second social network. We did social brackets index three, and that gave me the fourth social network. This is the same sort of thing. This is very subtle things, but if you if you notice, this is square brackets. So we've got. I've got all of these seven objects from 0 to 6. From 0 to 6. And inside of the particular object, I have all the individual fields. So to get a little deeper here, the third um, particular object, dot C name. Give me the name of the third object in the rows array, which is part of the results of my pouch database callback. Oh, actually, wait, one more thing. Let me check that. I think we're missing one more thing. Yeah, one more thing. Before C name, yeah, one more thing. Doc. The actual doc. If you look if you look in the array object, there's one more field in there that is actually doc. Show that. Doc. If I had only said, okay, give me the third, the fourth item of the database. The result there, okay, here's your fourth item, etc., ID, key, etc., doc. Inside of doc is where actually those items are. Doc.c. So it's nested. It's kind of a deep level in there. It's nested inside of this, inside of this. This is all of our data. Show me row three. Well, the doc of that row, particularly the name, and only that one name of that one object appears. Spanish. If I had, I have seven items there. So if I go to my sixth item, uh, maybe I didn't type anything into it. Let's see, five. On a few of these, I just type gibberish. 
Android 3. So um, this is retrieving the particular C name or C inst. Remember, I have also that. This one might not be as interesting. But whatever instructor name I save, that's how we're retrieving it. So fn show classes is actually a starting point here. I'm going to simplify this back down to result rows. This is a starting point. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to get an error at this point. Um, we have a database. I guess if we never initialize this database, if we never did init db, we make up a brand new name, we don't have a database to work with. So if we try to retrieve from the database, I guess that's how we can force an error. Um, don't worry about it. But uh, here what I'm trying to do is, okay, I've, I've, retrie I've retrieved in my case seven items of the database. It gave it back to me pretty much raw. And isn't the whole point of the previous classes also talking about, let's deal with this JSON formatted data and display it nicely. All of that JSON formatted data is right here. We want to display it nicely. So what I'm going to do is we will further call another function that its purpose is to clean this up and make it look nice. Function show classes, we can embed it all in one a really big if part here. But I want to do that in a separate function so that it's more modular, so that I can call that function as necessary. So we'll say, after console log, we'll have function show classes table. And pass into that function result.rows. Pass the data that I get from the database at this point into that function which we need to define and we're passing it into in a in a level of organization that is just basically the JSON data so then we can display it nicely in the following function after the end of our function show classes we need to define that function We pass data into the function from up there from a successful retrieval. Pass those rows of data into this function, which we'll define. And here we will build. We will show the data in a nice way. Variations of what we've looked at before. We're gonna have to loop through the rows of data displayed on screen in a table and so forth, an HTML table. we're going to start to do this is we're going to build um, an HTML table as a string and then display it on screen in that div that we've got waiting for us. Inside of this function we'll create a, a variable. We'll call it str string. We'll start off with um, writing um, p tag table tag, next line, string plus equals, end of the table, end of the paragraph. I'm doing this because I know that we're going to do a lot of that concatenation, a lot. We're going to show a little bit of the code plus the dynamic data plus more string plus dynamic data plus string. We're going to break this into multiple lines. It's going to get messy perhaps. But I know it's going to end up like this eventually. So we started the string. We started a paragraph to display. There's a table. We'll use an HTML table, open, close, paragraph. 
right here we're adding to the string and in the middle these are like the, the these are like the uh, the tops of the buns of a hamburger in the middle will be the the meat and the lettuce and all of that and that's coming up right after the break it's a bit of an endeavor so it's 841 we'll take a break take a break until 851 uh, make sure your code works at this point if you click that show button nothing much happens just yet except in your console after the break we'll process this data and make it look nice on screen